Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, I am so glad that everybody is here. Um, I do want to make sure that everybody knows um, you will be muted during the call, and we'll have a Q&A at the end of the call where I will unmute everyone. Um, if you do have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to include them in the chat, and I will make sure to get those answered for you at the end of the presentation. Um, but right now, I want to thank you again for joining us for ComCon and for coming to our closing session, Calling Students to Engagement, Intentional Teaching, Learn and Learning, presented by Stephen McCornack and Joe Ortiz. Uh, I do want to introduce our authors and give you a little bit more information about their background before we get started. Steve McCornack is a professor and basic course director in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. His scholarly interests include deceptive discourse production and deception, deception detection. Dr. McCornack teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on public speaking, interpersonal communication, relational communication, and language and discourse. He has received several awards for undergraduate teaching excellence, including the, um, Steve, I might pr mispronounce this, the Amoco Foundation Excellence. Oh, it's Amico. Amico. It's like Amico. Amico. Uh, the Lilly Endowment Teaching Fellowship and the National Communication Association Donald H. Eckroyd Award for Outstanding Teaching in Higher Education. Joseph Ortiz has taught for over 30 years, beginning in 1983 at Clovis Community College. Uh, he joined the Scottsdale Community College faculty in 1989, where he teaches courses on human communication, interpersonal and small group communication, and digital storytelling. Uh, uh, in support of student learning, Dr. Ortiz is heavily involved in the use of classroom assessment tools, service learning, collaborative learning methods, and the use of online technology. Uh, he has served as the chair of the Fine Arts Division, the Faculty Senate and President, and Interim Associate Dean of Instruction. He's the recipient of peer-nominated Outstanding Teaching Awards at Clovis Community College and Scottsdale Community College. Um, and Steve and Joe, thank you both so much for joining us, and I'm going to pass the ball over to you, Joe, and you can get started and I'll run the slides. All right, thank you, Katie. Um, I'm delighted to be talking about teaching and learning this afternoon. It's, um, you know, as Katie indicated, it's something I've been doing for over 30 years, and um, this afternoon, I guess Steve and I are going to take the first half hour. Uh, we're, we're dividing it in half, and as uh, Katie indicated, there will be uh, Q&A uh, when we're done. Um, so this question of, you know, what does it mean to be intentional in our work as teachers uh, and in the process to engage students to be intentional learners? You know, this is a question that I've been living with in different ways um, through my years of teaching. and. Early, early in my career, there were two experiences that, that were most um, um, formative in terms of my, my philosophy of teaching. Um, probably like many of you, I started as a TA uh, at a university where I was basically just handed a book and told where the classroom was and received uh, really no, no instruction about um, how to teach. And uh, it just so happened that um, my second year of graduate school, I had an opportunity to teach at a community college. It was about 20, 20 miles down the road. Uh, it was an evening class, met once a week. And it was particularly that experience where I started noticing a, a big difference between traditional college students and uh, community college students uh, at that particular campus who um, generally were older, they were, were working full-time, um, going to school part-time, they had family commitments. Many of them were uh, first-generation college students. And uh, one, one particular incident was, was most awakening to me, and that is, I, in, in that particular course, about the fourth week, um, I had um, a student come up to me, and I'll just say her name is Carol. and. Um, she told me, she, she was laughing at herself, and she said, you know, I want to I wanted tell you that I had been sitting in this class, and for the first two weeks, I, I thought that uh, you were completely nuts. And, and I said, well, you know, what, what, what do you mean? And she said, because I couldn't figure out how 
the things that you were talking about had what they had to do with uh, computers. And, and I said, computers? What, what do you mean? And she thought the prefix of the course com meant computer. And she laughed at herself and said, but I figured it out and I'm, I'm really enjoying the class. But for me, that was just, that was one of those uh, sort of earth shattering experiences um, in terms of who these students are. And it really put me into touch with the literature about the adult learners uh, and learning a lot about this particular population and uh, their demographics and their needs. So I started to become much more focused on who students are. Um, roll the clock about six, six years later when I arrived at Maricopa, I um, got introduced to um, a training that focused on what, what is known as a learning uh, paradigm. And um, specific to that was Bloom's taxonomy. <clears throat> now, and I know that for a lot of people these days, and particularly given the prevalence of instructional designers on, on college campuses and, and CTLs and even accrediting agencies that are mandating uh, uh, student learning outcomes assessment, um, the, the whole notion of learning objectives and Bloom's taxonomy is, is pretty widely known. But, um, this was back in the 90s before a lot of that stuff had sort of hit um, a lot of the college and university campuses. And so I hadn't, I hadn't been trained as a teacher. And uh, when I got exposed to uh, this particular uh, notion of planning lessons using learning objectives, to me that, that too um, was a game changer. And uh, I started seeing teaching as being less about covering content and more about focusing on students and the learning process and most importantly assessing um, their, their learning. So how have I codified this into a teaching philosophy or my teaching aim? Well, <clears throat> if I were to uh, kind of put it into one statement, it would be this, uh, that what I seek to do is to embolden students to be engaged and reflective learners in a course that demands mutual accountability and measurable outcomes. Uh, so, so what does this mean? Well, first of all, to embolden students. You know, one of, one of the things that has become quite clear to me in teaching at the community college level, and, and probably this is true at, at you know, most universities as well, is that students enter into the classroom with a great deal of apprehension about learning. Uh, but particularly in my environment, about a third of the students that come into my class are not college ready. Uh, they have actually tested into developmental writing and reading classes or, or both classes. Uh, they, they haven't been very successful in the K through 12 system at all. Um, they, they have sort of this, I don't belong here uh, narrative running through their heads. Um, and we also have, because we're 10 miles from Arizona State University, we have a lot of students who are, as one of our former vice chancellors used to call them, uh, swirling students. So these are students who have gone over to the university and usually for academic reasons, financial reasons, uh, personal life reasons, they wind up back on our campus. And so they have kind of this sense of failure uh, in, the, in their minds. So one of the things I have to be attentive to is that reality of the students sitting in my classroom. It also means that I really need to partner with tutors, uh, with personal counselors on our campus, disability resources and the like to make sure that the students are going to be successful in the class. The other part of this statement is um, that students need to be engaged in reflective learners. Excuse me, in terms of engagement, uh, the University of Texas at Austin, uh, as part of their community college survey of student engagement, uh, define engagement as the amount of time and energy that students invest in meaningful educational practice. And so one of the things I really try to put into the design of my course is a lot of collaborative group work, uh, problem-based assignments. Uh, they have to give a lot of presentations, which of course, you know, in a, in a comm class would make sense. Um, I also uh, have a lot of my course designed to motivate students to be reflective. 
um, you, you know, particularly in communication, we know that a lot of students come into our classes with a lot of um, life uh, experience and received wisdom about concepts that we teach, like self-concept and culture and leadership, uh, conflict. And so one of the things I have to be mindful of is tapping into that experience and trying to leverage it when it makes sense to leverage it, uh, deal with, um, you know, kind of false assumptions where they exist. And um, so we do that through um, a course that, that's highly reflective. I also, um, you know, within this definition, um, insist on mutual accountability, um, both for myself as well as my students. You know, I, I try to be very clear in, ter in terms of policy statements, of attendance, due dates, um, my expectations of a positive learning environment. Um, and I also, you know, I stick to a schedule. I come prepared for class. And um, I really work hard to get to know my students and, and uh, to honor where they are. And, and then measurable outcomes. So everything I do um, focuses on um, learning goals. So I, I, I took my experience of Bloom's taxonomy back in the day and, and uh, Everything I do is very outcomes driven and um, very clear objectives um, that I present to my students and, uh, and measure uh, in terms of learning. Um, and I am really um, a big proponent of formative assessment, so just kind of small scale ways of assessing what's going on every class period, whether it's like one minute papers or muddiest point or um, whatever it might be in order to find out um, how students are, are learning and experiencing the material. So how does this translate into practice? Well, I want to suggest um, three ways, very simple ways. One, I, I have what I call housekeeping slides, and so this is um, a very simple um, thing that I started maybe about 25 years ago, but I, I, I never realized at the time uh, how useful it is to students. And so an example of a housekeeping slide, I put this up um, at the beginning of every class period. And um, what it does is, you know, the top half of the slide, as you can see, kind of outlines what's due um, the following class period. So even though this information is available within our LMS system as part of the student's calendars or to-do list, um, I still have this available uh, to them in class. And then the, most importantly about this is the bottom piece of this, and that is uh, the game plan for every class period. So I took, you know, Bloom's notion of, of, um, of learning goals or learning objectives and turned those into learning goals, um, which is a language that I think is a little more palatable to students. And uh, I find that my students rely very heavily on this particular slide as they're getting ready for tests, um, assignments get tied to these learning goals. Uh, they learn this language when they come into my office and they have questions about assignments or they have questions uh, in preparation for a test. I see that they've often printed these out and uh, they kind of reference it. Um, and I had just last week uh, one of our faculty members in the counseling division had asked to um, sit in my class, and uh, she wanted to just simply observe me teach. And she followed up with an email that I got earlier this week where she was expressing her appreciation for being able to sit in the class. And she just, she also commented that I, I really love how you post the learning goals for the day. I wanted to incorporate them in my class. And so I find that this, this very, very simple technique helps reduce a lot of apprehension for students in terms of what are they supposed to be learning out of every class period. The second thing that I really try to do in order to um, make my, my own philosophy a little more manifest is um, I use a lot of reflective types of discussions, case studies. One particular type is what I call trigger scripts. Um, trigger scripts are simple vignettes that are used to introduce big topics. So they're, they're very quick little things. So for example, um, one trigger script that I use is called Two Hours Late, um, where when we're introducing uh, communication competence, 
I have my students uh, reflect on a, on a written uh, situation where you're out running errands, when your romantic partner texts you and says he or she's going to be two hours late uh, coming home from work, and so you decide that you're going to drop by the mall and just sort of kill time. About 30 minutes later, you pass a patio bar and you see your romantic partner is there having drinks with three coworkers. And one of the coworkers is someone that you believe um, uh, has a, an interest in, in your partner. So what are you going to do? How are you going to handle this? And so that generates a great deal of class discussion, a lot of reflection around what is competent communication in terms of effectiveness, in terms of appropriate choice, in terms of ethical choice. And it becomes um, a wonderful way to introduce um, that particular topic to the class. Um, and then finally, within uh, particularly the basic course, uh, which is one of the, the courses I teach, it's the intro course that covers the different domains of communication, um, we have to do a lot within the, the semester, uh, covering interpersonal group, um, presentational speaking, culture. It's, it's, it's a work. It's a course that has to do a lot of work. And so one of the things that I do within that particular class is a nonverbal photo story assignment. And uh, with that particular assignment, uh, it was inspired by a Flickr group um, where <clears throat> what students uh, are asked to do is within working within groups, they're assigned an area of nonverbal communication and then they have to tell a story using only five photographs. So tell a story using five photographs about facial expressions or personal space. Um, and within that particular assignment, I have an opportunity for them to learn about nonverbal communication. It also tackles um, small group communication to a small degree, as well as presentational skills. So there's this sort of scaffolding, if you will, of um, of competencies that um, get dealt with just through this one particular assignment with the students. Um, so just to, just to conclude, uh, these three examples are, are just uh, very small examples that work in concert with uh, my assigned reading and, and other learning activities and assignments um, to give my students what I think is a high impact uh, experience that, that really makes a difference in their learning. And, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Steve, to talk a little bit more about the notion of, of impact in teaching. So, Steve? Thanks so much, Joe. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to start, first of all, by thanking you know, Joe for um, uh, sitting in and joining us and, uh, uh, and for all of you folks taking the time out of your busy days. And, and for Katie, who so far has been just like right on on, on par as far as moving the slides forward accurately. <laughs> now, listen yeah. to you, Joan, I'm, and I'm totally ripping your ideas. I mean, these are great ideas. <laughs> um, I, one of the interesting things that strikes me uh, is in thinking about why we're all here at this moment um, is that all, all of us uh, probably share this experience in common as, as communication faculty that we didn't start out thinking this is where we would be. So uh, I doubt, I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's hugely presumptuous of me to say that probably all of us on this call right now, um, you know, weren't sitting in elementary school uh, dreaming of someday being a communication professor. So, so how did we get here? And, and we got here because at some point, usually in our collegiate career, midway through oftentimes, because communication is so often a default major that we find our way to, we, f we did find our way here, and we found our way here um, because we took that communication class and we had that professor uh, who quite literally changed our lives and, and maybe our life trajectory. For me, it was, um, I, I kept circling back. I, I was a number of different majors throughout my freshman and sophomore years. I was wildlife biology and astronomy and basically pursuing all these kind of passions I had that felt you know, perfect fit. But I kept cycling back to communication because I loved the content and I loved the, the, the faculty. They were just phenomenal. And uh, it wasn't until this one day I was taking an interpersonal class with the professor, Mac Parks. Uh, I, I, was, I was in his office hours, because I always went to his office hours and bothered him by asking questions. Um, he just looked at me and he said, have you ever thought about going into the field? 
And that was the trigger, speaking of triggers, that was a trigger point for me for deciding, because uh, I didn't even know what the field was, and that was my next question, like, what? What's the field? <laughs> and he's explained graduate school. And, and basically he said, you could spend your whole life studying and teaching this stuff, you never have to leave. And I'm like, that's something you can do in your life? I was just, I couldn't believe it. And, and so I was like, you know, sign me up. Um, but so it had that kind of practical uh, uh, impact on me in terms of, of trajectory, but it also had, um, it was just the content of the class. Because I was, as so many of us did, you know, when we were undergrads, you know, I was taking that con content home every day and living it and applying it to my relationships and applying it to other presentations and this kind of thing. And so I was thinking about in graduate school, I was thinking about all this one day as I was interacting with my grad advisor, Barbara O'Keefe at Illinois, and, and we were talking about how I could ever repay her and for all that she had done for me. And she looked at me with this kind of look and, and said, well, the way you repay me is by handing it down. And mm. so, you know, handing it down to others. And, and I thought, yeah. And so this has really guided me over the last 30 years of my teaching, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I, I think about the transformative impact of what we teach, the potential for transformative impact on people's lives. And, and this undergirds my philosophy of teaching, which in, in simple terms is just maximize impact. Mm -hmm. um, that is the content that we all teach as communication professors has this incredible potential to change people's lives and because it does so uh, it then becomes our greatest responsibility and I see it as, as a responsibility on us to teach it in a way that honors that potential that that maximizes the impact um, part of what undergirds my view of, of, of the importance of, of impact uh, is research that has been done on what distinguishes uh, superlative teaching for, from the merely good. And this really counts as the conceptual underpinnings for my philosophy. Um, there is research that was done uh, a number of years ago at my former institution. Um, let me just say how happy I am to say that. Um, nothing about <laughs> MSU, but I, but I just love being down here at UAB. It's a fantastic school. Um, and, and, uh, this was done by Professor Linda Jackson, and what she did was uh, uh, the largest scale assessment ever of the open-ended student responses, the write-in comments on student uh, teaching evaluations. And uh, she, she coded over 20,000 of these. And what she was trying to look at is what distinguishes the good professor from the superlative professor. In students' eyes, um, what uh, she didn't find uh, was anything doing to do with uh, easiness. Um, the, the correlation between a course grade and uh, teaching evaluations is very small. It's about point point one, point one two. So, um, you know, this is one of the things I think about a lot: is the, is the professor who gets poor evaluations and tries to defend the poor evaluations by saying, "Oh, well, students just don't like me because I'm rigorous." No, we have no data to support that. Um, in fact, uh, students know good teaching when, when they see it and experience it. And what Jackson was trying to do is what supports, what, what, how do students sift between good teaching versus the superlative? And she said there are these, there are these three factors, um, and they're competence, passion, and, and, and caring. Um, and the foundation is competence because students presume coming into the classroom they're going to get a competent professor, one who is well-versed in the content that's going to be taught. Um, so so that, that's, that's foundational. And, and what that means is as a teacher, you, you're given that up front. They're going to presume you have that. So you can really only violate it in a negative way. You, you can't violate it in a, in a positive way. Um, one of the, as, a, as a quick example, a concrete example, one of the um, most common ways that professors through the best of intentions, violate that competence on the first day is uh, by describing the classroom experience uh, to their students as one in which they say, um, I don't really see my role as me being teacher and you being student. I think we're co-learners going through this journey together. <laughs> um, now, this sounds really good in this idea that, yeah, we are going to be sharing the journey of the semester together, but students actually hate this. The data suggests yeah. because yeah. Um, they're looking to us as, as knowledge authority figures from whom they're going to learn. And if you say, "No, I'm going to learn as much from you as you'll learn from me," they're like, "Then why am I paying you to teach?" Um, so you really can't violate competence uh, except in a negative way. It's, it's a given. 
But then the issue is what's, what sorts out the truly superlative from the merely good, and it's these two aspects of passion and caring, and, and each subdivide into two components. Um, passion is, uh, the professor is deeply enthusiastic or passionate about the, the act of teaching and about the content that's being taught. And caring is this aspect, uh, also also twofold, of um, I, I felt that the professor cared about me as a person individually and also cared about me uh, learning the content as a student. So it's a dualistic role recognition. Um, and the interesting thing that was not, didn't show up at all in Jackson's uh, uh, data, and mind you, these are more than 20,000 open-ended student comments. Um, what didn't show up is, is technological whiz bang, or, or the shiny sparkly, as my my wife, who's also a professor, and I talk about it. You know, the, the, the kind of flash and shiny sparkly stuff that that oftentimes uh, administrators uh, think should be what is emphasized. Um, you know, online classes and, and fancy graphics and everything. Um, but 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 this wasn't the, the students uh, expressed a desire for or what they felt sorted out. Uh, good from superlative teaching. Instead, it's these kind of inta almost intangibles of, um, no, I just, the professor very obviously really wanted to be there each and every day and, and gave the impression that this was the only place they wanted to be at that particular moment. And also, they felt that they, they really cared about them. Um, so, taken as a whole, then, what does this all translate as? Uh, when I put this together with my view of, of the importance of impact, how do I incorporate passion and caring and competence and impact together? Well, it's all in this motto that I just walk into each class session with, which is, uh, and really pretty much every workday with, which is make every point of student contact uh, our account. That is whether it's an email or um, I was going to say text, but my students don't text me, thankfully. I don't I don't tweet either. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, this is Facebook me. I'm up on Facebook. Um, but make every point of contact count. So if it's an email, if it's an office visit, if it's before class, during class, after class, each one of these points of contact, I'm thinking, always in the back of my head, this little voice going, how can I maximize impact through being competent, passionate, and caring? Um, it's an ideal. It's an aspirational ideal. Um, and of course, as you're all are sitting there listening, you're probably going, that's, that's a ridiculous ideal. It's going to be absolutely exhausting. Yes. Yes, it is, <laughs> which is what we all bring to, to our classes. Right? We have this passion, enthusiasm, and caring, and it's exhausting uh, to be all idealistic about it. Um, so let me close uh, in my last uh, couple minutes here by just giving you, maybe I'll take just like a minute each, um, three different you know, takeaways in terms of specific things I do. Um, most of these you probably already know, um, but again, they kind of just re maybe serve as reaffirmation or maybe give you, you know, spark a new idea of something you might do and how I deal with my students. And I realize as Joe was talking about this, most of what I have to offer um, uh, is focused on, on students who are in, in, in uh, uh, you know, face-to-face -face classes rather than online, but I do have some ideas for online translation. Um, the first thing uh, is just the importance of the first day. Um, the research is very clear, and this is something which we all should recognize and embrace. Um, They've done research comparing course evaluations that administered course evals on the second day versus the last day. And what they find is no statistical difference. What that means is if you think about that, your students have decided what they think of you in the class, and it's set in concrete by the end of the second day. Um, and so it's not grade dependent, it's impression dependent. And what this means is the first day is extraordinarily powerful in shaping their impressions of the class. So um, I always put a lot of time and energy into my thinking and planning about what I'm going to do with the first day um, to uh, instantiate passion and caring and competence. And one of the big things I do is never, ever follow the formula that students expect for the first day, which, of course, is syllabus day and maybe not much content. Um, Instead, I go in and I always do some kind of activity right out of the gates. Um, in uh, my public speaking classes, I actually um, talk about George Washington at the banks of the Delaware and the power of language in transforming people's lives uh, uh, and, and history, because our country wouldn't exist if he hadn't 
uh, passed out copies of Thomas Paine's uh, uh, you know, American Crisis to his officers to rally the troops. And I actually stand up on a table and, and you know, <laughs> these are the times that tried men's souls, you know, the summer soldier and sunshine patriot and acted out. And my students are just sitting there cowering going, who is this crazy maniac up on the table? <laughs> um, but it isn't syllabus day. And, uh, it's cert and, and so, you know, you kind of get them out of thinking formula. Um, the second thing I do, and this really embodies or instantiates caring, uh, is I'm, I schedule, whenever my class schedule is set, I schedule the rest of my professional and personal schedule around the fact that I can be the first to arrive and, and the last to leave. Um, this uh, uh, not only creates an impression for the students that I am there for them, accessible and, and caring, uh, I'm, I'm doing meet and greet. I'm always there 20 minutes before and hang. I'm 20 minutes after. Um, but also the practical benefit of this is, is just it cuts down on office hours traffic um, because I can deal with concerns that they have uh, before or after class. Um, you know, you'd be, you'd be amazed at how powerful the impression is of the students have of the faculty member who comes in right at the buzzer and then runs out the door right afterwards. And sometimes our schedules don't allow us to do anything other than that. But um, but I've tried to establish my schedule so that I can always be the first to arrive and the, and the last to leave. Um, and, and to give them that, that, that time to kind of connect with them and get to know them and their personal stories and everything. And the final thing I'll leave you with, and then we'll open it up to a, uh, a much welcomed uh, a conversation with you all about, about all, all these things. Um, final thing I do is just is try to think out of the box in terms of assignments. Um, and um, as I always tell my students with out-of-box uh, assignments, uh, to everybody always says, think out of the box. And I always ask my students when I, when I say this to them, what's the first step? And of course, the first step to thinking out of the box is thinking what is in the box. So you go to what's in the box. That is, what's the standard thing that everybody in the situation would say or do within this situation performance-wise? And then you think, how can, I, how can I be different than that? How can I e exceed that? Uh, how can I go, you know, go beyond that? And so I try to, I try to embrace that uh, to show my passion and competence, uh, you know, in teaching. Uh, and just a couple quick examples, and then I'll be done. Um, within my uh, public speaking class, which I really don't consider a public speaking class, I consider it a self, a class teaching competence and confidence in self-presentation across contexts. Um, I have this open-ended assignment where they have to do a project that embodies presenting themselves uh, across situations in whatever way. Uh, they just have to clear it with me. So, um, of course, students just flip out because the degrees of freedom then are unlimited on the assignment. And they're like, how many pages does it have to be? And I'm like, it doesn't have to be a paper. <laughs> uh, and, and, and they just like, they, they want this template. And I say, yeah. it just has to reflect yeah. the semester's worth of creative thought and effort and represent you presenting yourself in a way that fits the class, but embodies you. And they just, so, so what's come out of that? Um, well, uh, I just had this woman come into my office uh, three days ago showing me her project in progress. And she's doing a series of paintings that, that depict the various assignments in the class. And the first one was the self-introduction presentation in which she did a great job and was extremely poised. And the painting was her in profile, looking very poised as she was, had her fingernails clawing into her shoulders, breaking the wow. skin and, wow. and blood welling forth. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's the most graphic, intense image. And she's like, well, I was very poised on the outside, but inside I was tearing myself up through anxiety uh, oh, yeah. and fear. I just thought this was an amazing depiction of this. And she's doing a series of, of such paintings on canvas. Um, and the last thing, I know I'm, I'm running long here, um, uh, is it why out of casket? Uh, <laughs> in my, my interpersonal relationship classes, I do this assignment uh, in which I have students write their relationship obituary. And it's the first day of class assignment. I have them envision if they had died, what would their, if they died today, what would their relationship partners say they were like? What kind of daughter or son or lover or best friend or roommate were they? And they have to format that in terms of an obituary. And so the first task they have to they have to read obituaries, and then they have to think out of that obituary formula, but frame it in that template 
uh, of who, what the legacy is that they've created as a relational partner, pluses and minuses. It can't be truly like an obituary and it's just everybody's a wonderful, happy, smiley, helpful person. But instead, who were they really? What was the legacy they, they really would leave if they left this life today? Um, once students get over the shock, because we're such a death phobic culture, um, they really embrace it. Um, and, and the results of these, these phenomenal things with photos in obituary format and creative causes of death, like died from too much homework and this kind of thing. And then what follows is a testimonial about who they were as a partner, which oftentimes includes actual interview excerpts because you know, one of the options you have is to go actually interview partners and family members, you know, and who, who do you think I am really? Um, so just a few things to spark ideas, and now I've, you know, talked far too long, um, and I want to open it up for, for a conversation with all of you and, and, and talking about this. But thanks again so much for spending part of your day with us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can go to any Q&A that we might have. I'm also going to unmute everyone in just a second. I do have a, I do have a quick question about uh, regarding the foundation of competence. What do you do if you don't have that, um, such as a new adjunct or if you're teaching a new subject? In terms of teaching competence? Yeah, in terms well, of so yeah, one of the key pillars with competence. Um, I, my my gut react. I chuckled because my gut reaction is to go bluff it. Uh, <laughs> no, what, what you do is um, uh, I I think it's important, and I'll just be straight up with you all. There are these situations in which we're called in to teach a class that, on very short notice, the, the content of which is is a material with which we're not familiar. Um, yeah. And what you have to do is uh, do a very quick immersion, and then um, you, you do the best to present that face to the class of, of competence, because they're trusting you to be a competent source for them to learn from you. And, and so I think in, in those situations, um, you, you do the best you can do because we've all been there. I mean, I have, uh, as well as most of you. Um, you know, the short notice, you know, assignment kind of thing in which we have to, in two or three weeks, scramble together and put together a syllabus and try and learn all about interpersonal when we're an org scholar or whatever. Um, <laughs> that being said, I, I do think, and this is just, you know, this is my personal take on this. And, um, uh, you know, Joe, I, I, you know, I would welcome you to chime in when I shut up here in a second, um, mm -hmm. is, is that it's very important to not let that card drop to the students. Um, because you right. may, may again think that it's important to be open and candid and say, say to the students on the first day, you know, well, I just want to let you know, I just got this assignment a couple weeks ago, so if it's kind of rough, I'm still just kind of learning this material too, I, I think that will be damning in terms of the impression that is created. It may be honest, uh, and you may be, be wanting to be disclosive, but I think, um, you know, and if somebody asks you, you don't lie uh, about it. But, but I think what you want to do is just try and get up to speed as quickly as you can and then, um, you know, in, in immerse yourself. And then each and every day, do your best to stay ahead of them because they're going to come to the class so, so much further down in terms of knowledge base to begin with um, that you have that edge start, but but I think you can't let that card drop. I, I, maybe Joe might disagree, but what are your thoughts? No, I, I agree no, completely. I, 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 I think, I, 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 I think oh, if we're talking about, I'm getting talking. some feedback. Yeah, I'm going to mute Steve while you're talking. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I agree completely with what Steve said in terms of if the question is related to having to teach a new subject, and, and I, yeah, I've, I've been there. Um, if it's about teaching competence, I mean, the assumption is that if you've been hired to teach, you've got some strength. It might be lecturing, it might be your content knowledge, who knows what it, what it is. And um, I, I think that there's all kinds of help available on campuses um, within the department in which you've been working. Of course, if it's a small college, um, you might be someone at a loss of, of finding a faculty member who, um, can mentor you, um, but to look outside even the department because a lot of 
teaching is uh, not necessarily discipline specific. So it's possible to be able to find someone that you can talk to. Uh, teach, the good teachers love to talk about teaching. And so being able to find a mentor and to hit your wagon to, to someone that has been identified either within the department or without as a good teacher is a place to start. Uh, and then, of course, uh, a lot of campuses these days have centers for teaching and learning that have um, really good resources available and good support uh, to help you sp um, expand your, your teaching repertoire. So um, <clears throat> I think that there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Um, you know, historically, teaching has been conceived as a very private type of activity. It's between you and your students, but, but I think uh, a lot of college campuses uh, have pockets in some cases of, um, of people that are really interested in talking about teaching and helping people develop, and so it's just a matter of finding it. Yeah, the other thing you can do, which, and, and this is a whole discussion that would t last another hour, um, is this thing that, that Joe opened with uh, at the beginning of his, his talk this afternoon, which is, um, most of us are self-taught. We're self-taught teachers because most of us are handed a textbook uh, early in our careers and said and told go yeah. teach. Um, I, I was kind of given a syllabus my first year as a grad assistant and the textbook, and then we went through a whole a series uh, for two days of workshops that had to do with mostly legal stuff. Like don't fraternize with students and this kind of thing, you know. And, and then, okay, good, good luck. Have a good semester. And, and so, um, what I did from the start was always, always, always go to. And it's actually it's exactly what you and I were talking about, Joe. Um, mm -hmm. I, I go right to my experiences as a, as a student, and I mm -hmm. think, what did I go through as an undergraduate? What challenges did I face? And w which teachers that I love and which were not as mm -hmm. successful in engaging me or motivating me or whatever. Um, and it's kind of akin to my kids, I mean, my boys that I've, you know, tried to raise thinking, um, you know, what do I wish that I had been taught when I was there, <laughs> you know, and that's been a guiding force in my, in my parenting. And, you know, and students aren't our children, but, but it's the same kind of model of, of, of always, if you have no basis for for experience, if you're a brand new adjunct, uh, just starting out in teaching, you go to your experience as a student and, 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 and the professors who you loved and you try to emulate them because I don't, I see it as kind of ironic that I'm hosting a session like this now, even though I've been doing this 30 years, because I'm not a role model in my own eyes at all. My role models mm -hmm. for teaching are, are the faculty that I had, like Mac Parks. And, and John Campbell and John Bridgman at the University of Washington, and Barb O'Keefe at University of Illinois, these, these people I consider the greats who were just, are just unbelievably inspirational teachers who I look up to even to this day. And, and, um, and so I pull, you know, we, we rip their material and, and they, uh, in a sense, of, in a good way, and we, we, you know, use that inspiration to power our teaching. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I'm going to mute you, Steve, while I'm, while I'm asking the question, because you're, you're keep giving feedback. But um, I do have a question from uh, Jennifer. For oral presentations, what kinds of out-of-the-box variations do you use for informative and persuasive speech assignments? Um, uh, uh, Joe, Joe, I, go. But, yeah. I, I have a couple. Uh, one that I use right now for the informative speech, I mentioned um, earlier that, you know, the challenge in teaching the intro course was so much that you have to cover. Um, one of the things that I use for the informative presentation is just simple three-object talk, uh, where the student very early on in the semester has to take three objects to introduce themselves in about a three to five minute uh, speech. Uh, to the class, and, and within that particular assignment, they get um, kind of a first step ice-breaking experience of public speaking. I tie it to the chapter on self and self-disclosure, and um, also we talk a little bit about outlining. So, you know, that's another example of, of trying to think of how one assignment might achieve multiple objectives within the course itself. 
uh, the sort of pancaking, if you will, or scaffolding, whatever you want to call it. Um, for the persuasive um, presentation, I haven't done this in a while, but it, I used to do it and it worked really nicely, um, was a group project actually where the students uh, would take the motivated sequence uh, for persuasion, that very simple model um, that is um, an organizing principle for speech of action, and they would, working as a group, create an infomercial where they had to uh, make each of those five steps very explicit in terms of the infomercial that they would put together. And the students had a lot of fun with that. Um, it would um, give me some insight as to uh, the extent to which they really understood the motivated sequence. And uh, um, then there was also some group stuff that, that got accomplished through that particular assignment. So with um, uh Mine, and I'll speak to, because uh, I'm just looking at the clock here, I'll, I'll speak to the, the persuasion one. Um, I, my concern within my self-presentational skills class is always, um, I want to think out of the box with assignments and allow them the creative freedom. That's why I have the project, uh, which counts equivalent to the, the bigger presentations. Um, within the presentations, presentational assignments themselves, um, I want to allow them that creative freedom, but I also want to have exportability of skill set. So I'm always thinking, uh, how does this translate into real-world application? And my goal is not to train up my students in a traditional public speaking model to be little orators, but to be able to go out into a variety of contexts and actually use the, the assignments. And, and consequently, um, because we have a lot of business-minded uh, uh, kids, uh, what, I always, what I do with the persuasive assignment is they can they can come in and do a kind of a classic persuasive pitch, or they can do a sales pitch. Uh, if they have a product they feel strongly about, they, they can use this as a context to try and sway us, and part of their evaluation will be whether they actually get people to want to buy the product. Um, I had a guy pitch his herbal supplements last spring, and <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, I also take the, and maybe this is out of the box, I don't know, I, I don't have any topical constraint on, on the box, so to speak, of the assignment. That is, I tell my students, and, and, and down here in Alabama, this, is, this is, can be quite interesting, um, that, that there's absolutely no limit on what they want to talk about other than audience adaptation. So uh, they, they, can, they can take five minutes and pre. They can take uh, five minutes and, and pitch a product. They can take five minutes and argue about whatever. Um, but it has to have, it has to recognize audience adaptation uh, and, and, and all the other competencies which we stress throughout the semester because it is the capstone assignment for me and my classes. It's the, is this a solo persuasive pitch as I frame it. Um, and with no uh, fetters on the uh, topical possibilities or uh, um, and the multi functional possibilities of I can do a sales pitch or, a, or an attitudinal thing or a, a spiritual thing or whatever, you, I get some really interesting presentations in there, as you can well imagine, yeah. um, some yeah. pretty controversial ones too, but of course they all know that they're going to fail right out of the gates if they don't have an audience adapted to what is really a quite diverse community, both belief-wise and you know, ethnically, socioeconomically, et cetera, at, here at UAB. So. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any other questions on the phone? What about online assignments? Oh, so um, meaning uh, uh, is that is that directed to me or anyone? Anyone? Um, so on um, oh. Joe, Joe, you, I know you teach. Uh, well, online. well. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't teach online. I, I taught a, a hybrid course uh, last year, and uh, I wasn't particularly fond of that modality. So all of my classes are face to face. But I do have, in the intro course, I have my students give a um, a video speech. So they they do this toward the end of the semester, and they're asked to take about five minutes to. Um, construct a, it's an informative speech, it's personal narrative, I give them a list of possible topics, you know, kind of a turning point in your life, for example, or your most embarrassing moment. 
And the rationale I build uh, for that particular assignment is um, actually a, a couple of things that tie back to my daughter and experiences she had as an undergraduate of having to present herself on camera and talking with me about how to do it. Um, and so I, I kind of tell the, the students that those two stories of my daughter making applications for uh, internships as well as um, an application she made with Apple Computer, um, both of which were involved um, online interviewing. Um, and so I use that as a rationale of, you know, this is a skill set that you really need to develop. If you haven't already been doing this, you will be doing it. There's a little bit of resistance initially about this, but then I remind them you guys take selfies all the time. So, you know, seeing yourself on camera shouldn't be that bad of a thing. Um, I think really some of that resistance, though, is having to um, do it in such a formal way. Um, but that's really the, the only type of online um, assignment that I, that I give, other than, of course, you know, loading papers up through our LMS and that sort of thing. Uh, but I don't run any sort of uh, virtual group um, projects. Um, I have used group discussions before, online group discussions. And, uh, but yeah, that's about the extent of my, my online activity and teaching. Um, let me, I, I don't, it just be redundant uh, and, 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 you know, and, and not useful in response to your, your question about online, but I, um, I want to double down Joe's answer because, and, and, and elaborate just a bit um, in terms of what I do, because this is um, the, the one, because uh, I, I, I teach face-to-face -face down here uh, at UAV, but the one online uh, assignment I use, which is um, uh, something that, that any of you teach online sections of the, of the intro course or public speaking course could do is, the, is a Skype interview. Um, and so it, it's it's really important to have this competency as a skill set because especially down here in Alabama, many students are going to be um, interviewing out of state. Most of the students here at UAB are medical students uh, in medical tech and industry associated industries, and so most of them are going to be traveling out of state uh, for employment. And uh, and and as we all know, most initial interviews, if it's out of state, it's going to be Skype. They're not going to fly you out um, or some similar web based web based format. Um, the, the students, although they, as Joe aptly said, are, are, are so familiar with, um, uh, you know, selfies and even YouTube videos of themselves that they then post and stuff, it, it's amazing to me how little they know about the actual mechanics of competent and confident self-presentation on camera. Um, things like the importance of lighting, of, of, of background, of um, of, of of, uh, how, of proximity of camera to self. So I just had this assignment finished last week, um, and a, a woman was doing a makeup on this assignment just two days ago, and, and we went through this in, in talking with her about she had the camera too close, so that, so that it was kind of like um, looking at one of Dr. Phil's book covers, where you just, <laughs> you, all you can see is face. And I, and I said, and then she said, oh, and then so she, so then she like sat way back, and so I could, so she was like too distant, and, and so I had to tell her, well, you want to see your hands in motion, but not have it be too close, and then the lighting and mode of dress and all this kind of stuff. So just like the mechanics of filming can, can can make a huge impression formation difference right out of the gate for Skype, which is or any kind of webcam based media, which are very unforgiving. And how they portray us, um, and and so I go through all of that with my students, and, and this woman just stuck out of my mind because I was just meeting with her two days ago, uh, or so, and um, it, we go through all that, and then the um, all of the stuff which is uh, which Joe and I talk about in our in our book, of course, with um, in the interviewing section. Uh, th this is one of the core assignments in my classes because this is, uh, as I always tell my students, this is the gateway through they must which you know through which they must all pass to get to the dream job. And the way I actually execute the assignment, which would be useful, I think, for some of you to know if you, if you haven't done this assignment before, is I create the interview protocol, but the first question I ask the student is, um, so, so which of the open positions are you interviewing for today? And then they answer by giving me their dream job. And I've had people this last two weeks uh, 
as the head choreographer for American Ballet Theater, uh, uh, head uh, tech designer for uh, Google, um, software security expert. You know, uh, one, one woman interviewed, uh, interviewed for um, uh, special ops uh, with uh, the CIA. Uh, <laughs> so it was incredible <laughs> bandwidth. And, and then I used the protocol, which we have in our book, uh, which I just go through starting with the standard elevator speech question, and why do you want to work here, and weaknesses and strengths, and some off-topic uh, uh, questions like, uh, you know, if you were an animal in the forest, what animal would you be, and, and <laughs> book in the last year, this kind of thing. And, and, um, and it works really well, giving them the freedom to interview for the job they dream of, of having uh, using that template, um, but then forcing it into an uh, online-based media with, with which you know, many of them are going to have to be familiar for really doing it. Um, and it's a really high-impact practical assignment in terms of the takeaways. Um, well, I think that that's all the time we have uh, today. So if you do have any more questions, please feel free to let us know. Um, you can comment on this uh, space on the community.mcmillan.com. And thank you all for joining us for ComCon in general. We've had a really great time over the past couple of days. We're so thankful for our authors being able to be here with us. And sorry, Steve, for having to mute you, but the feedback. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you all so much. And we will be posting this online soon so you can share it with any colleagues um, you might be interested, think might be interested. So thank you and have a great weekend. Okay, thank you, Katie.